So, we would really like to have a little bit more independent- What you are saying is that you are happy as our puppet state. Yes, happy. We are happy the way things are. Well, how about we help you a little bit? Welcome to the 19th century, a time of change, progress, and a little bit of geopolitical drama. On the one side, we have China, home of the Qing Dynasty. Once a towering titan on the world stage, it was now struggling with more issues than the student learning for exams. We're talking corruption, inefficiency, and rebellions popping up left and right. Not a great look for China. Can somebody please deal with all these rebellions? And where's my paperwork? Oh, right. They're probably lost with all the other ones. And if that wasn't enough, foreign powers swooped in to take advantage of China's vulnerability, too. They handed out unequal treaties and grabbed some land whilst they were at it. China was pissed. But there's more. The people of China were getting pretty fed up with this whole situation, too. They were demanding reforms and wanted an end to the corruption in the country. And you can't blame them. Now on the other side of the sea, we've got Japan. These folks were on a makeover mission called the Meiji Restoration. Picture this, they're swapping kimonos for suits and samurai swords for, well, bigger swords. Industrialization, here they come. Japan was like that one friend who suddenly decides to join the gym, learn five languages, and start a rock band all at once. They were modernizing quickly. The new power came with a little bit of an attitude. Japan was flexing its muscles on the international stage, determined to show that it wasn't just a tiny archipelago anymore. Watch out, world. The land of the rising sun is rising higher than ever, and maybe knocking over a few things in the process. Your Majesty, who are you talking to? Are you alright? So China was going down, and Japan was rapidly industrializing. And now, welcome to Korea, the middle child caught in the crossfire of the sibling rivalry. On one side, you've got China treating Korea like its favorite pet and wanting to maintain its traditional influence over the Korean peninsula. On the other side, we've got Japan, who's telling Korea about the wonders of independence and the possibilities of modernization. And as if things weren't complicated enough, the Dongkak Peasant Rebellion kicked off in Korea. It was like the peninsula's version of a family argument at Thanksgiving dinner. We demand change, and maybe a few less taxes while we're at it! And guess who decided to crash this rebellion party? Yep, you got it, China and Japan. Like those guests who show up uninvited and start rearranging the furniture. We just wanted to, you know, offer some guidance to these rebels to make sure they do the right thing. Tensions started to skyrocket. Both China and Japan sent their troops to Korea, turning the rebellion into an international showdown. And so, the war kicked off with the series of skirmishes in July 1894 in the scenic town of Asan, a picturesque location for, you know, a full-blown confrontation. Wait, what are we doing here again? You're about to witness Japan's modern might. Get ready to be overwhelmed. And overwhelmed them they did. Both sides were flexing their muscles, showing that they meant business. But then, things escalated further. It was September 1894, and the Battle of Yalu River was about to erupt, a naval showdown like no other. The Japanese fleet was commanded by Admiral Tsuboi Kozu, and the Chinese fleet was led by Admiral Ding Ruchang. Japan had a trick up its sleeve, modernized military and naval forces, and China was like a small mouse compared to Japan's high-tech weaponry. Can somebody tell me where the modern button is on this cannon? The Battle of Yalu River was like a fireworks show, except the fireworks were made of metal and killed you on impact. Japan's strategy and firepower were a sight to behold, and they quickly gained the upper hand. And so, victory was claimed by Japan at the Battle of the Yalu River, making a turning point in the war. But Japan hadn't enough. They were like, hey China, do you want to play a little game of hide and seek? Because we want to. Ready or not, here we come! And Port Arthur, a vital naval base for China's fleet, was about to become the centerpiece of Japan's victory parade. You guys are now officially under new management. Congratulations! Japan's naval brilliance continued to shine with a naval blockade that isolated China's forces. And the Japanese were advancing fast. They were grabbing land and sea victories like they were picking flowers in a garden. But the best was yet to come. It was nothing other than the Siege of Waihaiwi. 
Picture this, a fortified Chinese port on the Shandong Peninsula, with Japanese forces eager to finish the battle with a bang. The Chinese were holding strong, determining to keep the strategic position from falling into Japanese hands. The air was thick with tension as cannons roared and waves crashed against the shore. It was a battle of wills, determination, and really big cannons. And in the end, Japan's naval prowess prevailed once again. They smashed through the defenses, captured the port, and took a giant leap closer to victory. Victory was sweet, but it wasn't just about the taste of triumph. It was about the strategic conquest that would shape the course of history. The Siege of Waihaiwi was a turning point, a climax that sealed the fate of the Qing Dynasty. The Treaty of Shimonoseki in April 1895 was the final nail in the coffin. China was forced to sign, officially ending the war and ceding several territories to Japan. What if I don't want to sign? Well, always nice making deals with you guys. China had to hand over Taiwan, the Pescadores Islands, and the Liaodong Peninsula to Japan. China's territorial losses were more than just a land exchange. They were a stark reminder of their weakened state. It was like giving your lunch money to the school bully. Meanwhile, Korea was like a phoenix rising from the ashes. The war's outcome granted Korea newfound independence, shaking up the regional order and opening its doors to a world of new influences. Finally, a chance to write our own destiny. Oh, yeah. Own destiny, right, right. <laughs> I almost forgot about that part. But the consequences didn't stop at some borders. The war stirred up a whole pot of nationalism in China and Japan. And guess what? The world was watching, too. The war's outcome was like an earthquake shaking up East Asian interactions. It was a signal that China's historical dominance was facing a challenge, while Japan's rise was stealing the show. Get ready, world! There's a new player in town, and we're here to make waves. Your Majesty, who are you talking to again? The war might have ended, but its impact was felt far beyond this conflict. The consequences were profound and ultimately contributed to the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1912 after 267 years of existence, leading to the creation of the Republic of China and then the People's Republic of China that we know today. I'd like to thank my subscribers on Patreon who make this content possible. A special thanks and shout out to FlappyBird7216, Badger Refounded, and Dulles. This type of content is pretty time consuming to produce. If you want to support my channel and help me create more of these videos, please consider subscribing to my Patreon under patreon.com slash history with Seth. As a thank you, subscribers receive exclusive behind the scenes content, early access to, and a shout out at the end of every video and decide what future videos should be about. So thank you for your support.